All right, guys. Welcome back to the No Bad Dogs podcast. We have my training peeps here, some of them anyway. Big BB is out today. <laughs> right? Big Bert. Big Bert's out sick. He's out. He's out sick. So anyway, uh, Greta. No, we put him on the turf. Oh. You put him on the turf? Wait, yeah. is Lakota still Lakota's on the turf. Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> it's not too bad out. She's good. I talk about that all the time. I'm like, sometimes I put my dog in a downstay and forget she's there. She's not in a downstay, though, so that's good. Anyway. <laughs> that we know of. Yeah. <laughs> On today's podcast, we're going to be talking about all these different fun dog training-related uh, questions, not all dog training. Uh, and also, Greta is walking around, too, so if you see a German Shepherd click-clacking and walking around, that's her. So let's start off with the with the first thing that people had asked on Instagram. One of the first questions is, good, low-ingredient treatos. What did you call it? Treatos. Treatos. Yeah. So what's your be- – my favorite treat – I'll go first. Can I go first? Please. My favorite treat to train with is Stewart's Pro Treats. If I had them right here, which they're over there, I would. They um, are at Happy Howie's. Please sponsor us. <gasps> is that the the rolls, the rolls. The sausage rolls? Yes, they're amazing. Wait, no, 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 not the crumbly ones. The ones no. that hold well. The yes. new oh, they're okay. here yeah, right yeah, yeah, now yeah, 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 yeah. in the facility at Happy Howie's. Please sponsor us. Kyle, this is only a question for you because you've been here the longest. Is that the the treats that we used to use at the old facility? Yes. Is your name Kyle? Yeah. And how do you know? Well, they were here when she started, too. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, we you had them since there I've, too. I've been here. My bad. Oh, see? Stink She's face. good at remembering. Okay, Happy Howie's, good treat training, and then Stuart's Pro Treats. Anything else? Dehydrated anything. Beef liver, yes. which is the Stuart's, but lamb lung. Lamb lung. Always yep. a good go-to. It's my favorite. Yeah, it's nice because anything dehydrated breaks apart really nicely, too. So when you're training, the the dog can break the treat down without having to take the whole thing. That's what I, I run into a lot of problems with people who use like really, yeah, what? Big thing that I find is people come in with treats that are too big and crumbly. And if yeah. you're trying to do fast repetitions, the yeah. dog is spending time either, you know, cleaning up the crumbs on the ground or people are like, hey, peanut butter. And the dog just sits there licking and licking and licking. Yeah. Or anything that takes too long for them to chew. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Delivery and timing when you're rewarding your dog is really important so you don't want anything that's gonna crumble all over the place which drives me crazy that you guys use the sand that you use it wasn't it was by choice not, it was by force it was it was by happy howie's being out of it was it was production yeah okay but there's so many other treats out there that you could have got you didn't have to get sand and you ordered a hundred rolls of them but it was i smelly. did not personally order those all right whatever let's let's did you have something to say Kason, about that or no. The treats were smelly. The yeah. dogs did like them. I will say that. Well, they like yeah. anything. They like they like their own poop. All right. Well, depends right. on the dog, I guess. Mm, that's true. Okay. <laughs> Next question on the old chart list. We're going to answer a bunch of different questions, and it's going to kind of go over the place. This is a good one. I love this question. Oh, actually, Ooh. before we get into that, I have something I forgot to tell you. When I was at when when we were on tour and I was working at this shelter, they had and you guys have probably seen this because you're especially you missed TikTok. This is probably a TikTok thing. It was, they used the Chuck It, so the Chuck It thrower. Adelaide. Do you know? It's an Adelaide. With peanut butter in there? Yes. I yeah. just did that with Darby. Or I did the treat in there and I dumped it. Yeah. Yes, I did so that. They, so they had this dog that was kind of pushy, and they took a spoonful of peanut butter, put it in the thing, and then lured, mm-hmm. which is a great idea. But Can I, I uh, so when I was in high school, mm-hmm. um, we did a, a training class. And like a dog training class in yes, high school? Yes, I went to high school for companion animal science. She went to a Ag. farm farm high school. An agricultural high school. Yeah. Shout out Essex Tech. We love you. Wait. Um, wait, back up. <laughs> she would, like They rode tractors and yes. stuff? And no. Picked, yeah, they like went in the field it, and collected like, hay. So Diesel engines. Diesel engine repair. Julia knows how to do it. Um, You've got farm equipment that breaks it, down. She's there. It's <laughs> like Cobalt skill, but make it high school. And I majored in companion They had, like, animals. goats and cool. horses. How do you ma- First of all, how do you major in high school? We picked a major. So th- they they made us try a bunch of different things. We tried, like, plant science, animal science, and... Plant science? Wait, I was, what was, it was this when you were, like, a senior? No. I no, was like a freshman You went into it. Yes, and you chose, a, like, a, a field to, to and s- and specialize in. Were you there, too? No, but it was right. We grew up in the same yes, area. Yes, we grew so up. Oh, like, you did. Shout out Massachusetts. So here's a funny story. So I... For the, my entire life, thought I wanted to work with horses, and I was pissed that I didn't get into the equine science program, and I got into the companion animal science program, and now look at me. This is blowing my mind. So anyways, when I did a training class yeah. there, it is very brief. It's like, 
basically you know enough to like make a dog sit really but um what we did we had like paint stirrers yeah and we did peanut butter on those yeah that makes sense yep that Roddy had a spoon with peanut butter. Yes. Yeah. Good. He did. Yeah. He, so he, that. He was spicy. Yes. So I sneezed. That he hated Roddy, me for the rest of the time. Remember that Roddy that I was closing that night? Yeah. And Wait, I Wait, the Roddy that's really Adobe? No. No. no, he, was no, a, no. he was a Roddy. No, not my Adobe Roddy. Roddy he, he was a Roddy lab. Yes. And I was closing that night and I texted Zach. I was like, I cannot get this dog out. And he called you. Did he, I come? No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't remember. I he had a spoon that he was spoon fed with. He was spoon fed like half of his meal to get him to start eating. Is that here? Yes, and that is how we built a relationship with that dog. Yeah. Was that spoon? Yep. Bring him out of his kennel. He just grabbed that spoon. He yep. lit up. He, he was, was so like, excited. "Let's go!" Yeah. So jazz. It was amazing. There you go. So that's another thing for anybody out there that's dealing maybe dog trainers that are dealing with a spicy dog in the beginning. Get a spoon. <laughs> Also, yes. short dogs, short dogs, small yes, dogs. That's what right? we used it for. Too now. tall. You're too tall. Well, reached. Wait a minute. Are small dogs short? <laughs> oh, that is a good one. Oh, that's right? It's all relative. Proportional. I think every dog is short to right. you, but it's, if it's small, it's proportional. But if it's short, it just has short legs. Right. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's small. Hey, do we think our little Maltese friend? Yeah. What about our little that Maltese? Maltese? Is he short small. and small? Short. He's, and small. he's small. He's petite. He's petite. He is, he is petite. He's a sweet little He's petite. He's an extra, mustache, extra, man. extra small. Okay, oh, moving on. Cute. So peanut butter is good. All right. <laughs> tra- tra- okay, this is a good one. So traits <laughs> and yeah. qualities to look for when, when rescuing or adopting wait, a Wait, wait. No, no, no. Wait. Can we answer for other people what we think the traits that they would look for would be? Yeah. Can I go first? Julia, spotty. <laughs> Do you have a spotty dog? She'll take it. Julia's going to take it. But she's all, she also just informed me that she's in a giant schnauzer group. <laughs> she's in every group uh, I join. Julia has been a member for and five months. <laughs> five years. And <laughs> what breed of dog am I getting next? I just told you this. Uh, Lee and Burger. Nope, wrong. Oh, Gronendale. Oh, Gronendale. Gronendale. We're Sorry. really into yep. Gronendales after A Mushy. Belgian Shepherd. Mushy. Smooshy. I love you if you're watching. <laughs> First of all, okay. <laughs> Answer the question, people. <laughs> hey, okay, here I go. <clears throat> I think rescuing a dog is quite like a lottery. Like, if you know what you're kind of what you're looking for, you can kind of guess guess to me. I also think it's very dependent on the dog's age. Yes, I think quality. So, what what is that about quality? So, it's what qualities are you looking for? So, I mean, I I guess I can only really speak for myself, but. Yes. Well, I just think in general, if one quality Australian cattle dog. No, I'm just kidding. If you're, what you're looking for is probably a compatible dog with your lifestyle. So a dog that, uh, if you're looking for a chill, I work a lot, I travel a lot, I'm busy, but I'd like to have a companion. Maybe a larger, older dog or an older dog in general would be good. A, you can, you might be able to bring them to work possibly. But I think Matt, I think that's something that we see often is there's this emotional tie with people adopting or rescuing dogs. And to personally, I don't really like like using the rescue thing. We talked about that earlier, Katrina, about how there's some um, words out there that kind of trigger emotion for people, and it could set them up for failure because they're like, "You have to rescue this dog," and rescue kind of means like, if you don't, then. You know, and that may be the case in some cases, but I just adopting a dog regardless, I think you have to look at your lifestyle. You have to look at how much you're working. If you are going to have kids in the future, because we see this a lot, people will get dogs, their life will change. Either they'll move into a new place or they'll downsize or even upsize or they'll get a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner and things change. So I think you have to look at where you're at in your life and what's going to happen in the next however long the dog is going to be alive for. One big thing that we see too is dogs getting along in the same household because that makes our jobs really challenging when we get a client that comes in that says, hey, uh, I just rescued this new dog or adopted this new dog. And after about a week or two, they my dogs started going after each other or once the dog started to mature. So those are some things that you're going to look for. Um, as far as qualities and traits, you're looking for, I would say, I'll let you guys kind of pick up from here, but I would say energy levels would be huge qualities that you would look for because somebody who hikes, runs, is on the go a lot, like an energetic dog that can go out and run for you or play chuck it together is good. 
But again, if you're somebody like we see, we see clients all the time, especially elderly clients, get dogs that are way too much for them. Also, I see a lot of just people getting a breed of dog and a different caliber of dog. So there's so many different types of shepherds. There's different types of golden retrievers. There's working lines, show lines, etc. I see a lot of people who just think that breeds are breeds. I'm going to get a German Shepherd. And I'm like, what flavor? Like, what are you getting? Right? And I think some people don't even realize that that's on the table. Or they're like, I'm just going to get a German Shepherd that's black because it looks good. And they in, end up getting an imported Czech dog that is probably supposed to be in the back of a police car. And then they're like, hey, what's going on? So those are just off the top of my head, like things that you need to be looking for. Energy level, age, the breed, and then the even mixes, right? So we see a lot of terriers, like a lot of pit bull terriers getting put out. I think even a, even a harder breed consistently, because we've seen pit bulls be like lazy mushes. And then we've seen pit bulls or pit bull mixes be super territorial and also very like drivey because they're terriers. But I think across the board, the hardest breed consistently or the breed group are the hounds. Because people get them and they're not good pets. That doesn't mean they can't be. Murphy, very good pet. Great personality. <laughs> However, I agree. Hounds are tricky. They're the uh, what I see a lot: whining. My dog constantly whines. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's a hound. They're a hound. She's a hound, and just not meeting the physical. I guess traits to look for, or qualities to look for in a rescue dog. Knowing the breed, of course, or knowing the mixes, and knowing how you can meet those genetic, like the baseline. How can you satiate what the dog was meant to do? Um, and I know it's been talked about here a lot, but like the backyard. Your hound is going to dig holes. Your Great Dane is going to dig holes. Your every your whatever dog, your whatever mix is going to dig holes if you're not giving them the outlets that they need. So um, traits uh, that I would look for are, is this something that I can give this dog? With my hound, I was biking him. I was running. I was walking with him five miles a day. And some of that I would train him. I trained him to ride or walk, uh, run alongside me with the bike because sometimes I just didn't have the energy to walk that far as far as yeah. he needed as a young hound mix. So... You know, I was like, all right, cool. Like, I will adjust my lifestyle to what this dog needs. And that was great. And met his needs. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. A big a big topic we talked about last time was definitely knowing the breed. And I know rescues and shelters, they can't always give that accurate information. And we have seen a lot of clients come in that thought they were getting a lab mix. And they had a shepherd, border collie, whatever mix. Um, and then that brought a lot of qualities that they weren't really ready for. So kind of going back off of what Julia said is like, it is kind of a lottery. So, I mean, I think you also have to go into a rescue situation kind of being on guard of the fact that you might not be getting exactly what you're expecting and having some form of you know dedication and consistency to be able to give them what they need regardless but also you know having that really in-depth conversation with where you're getting it from of if they have those qualities or not are they going to meet this lifestyle and just being honest and upfront from the beginning because you don't want the dog bouncing around from home to home or you know being stressed out where they are or not getting what they need but if you can understand the breeds that are in there and that you're working with I think you're going to find a lot more success moving forward in the rescue yeah all right I'm gonna pop off a little bit here pop oh. off queen um I I think I'm gonna t so basically uh, pipples um I think that there is a big push sometimes rescue wise and I think there's also an aspect of it that's like heartstring tugging to be like oh yeah these don't bully my breed right mm -hmm. these these dogs are um like whatever they demonized or whatever um I think what people don't understand and I think there are people going into it with great intentions but people do not understand what a working breed that they truly are and I think that me being the TikTok queen that I am, um, social media has not necessarily helped in that sense because they have this house hippo idea and people are putting sunglasses on their lazy yes. pit bull with robes and shower caps oh, and whatever else. American pit bull terriers. 
Huh? They're also not American pit bull terriers. They could be. Well, I think I think that's a whole different conversation about what is a pit bull because that I mean we could sit here for hours and discuss. I agree. The misconceptions behind that. I agree, but overall speaking, like you have to be prepared to get a very cracked out dog and like not all dogs are going to be that house hippo that you see with a robe on or whatever like that isn't pit bulls all pit bulls i guess mm-hmm. necessarily. Well, i think the one thing with terrier breeds in general too that people don't realize is if, if they if they are drivey they can be some of the driviest dogs yes. in any room and yep. it's like they're either they're either on or off and yep. it's like they are intense intense dogs when they are intense which mm-hmm. I, I don't think i think a lot of people are blind to from an emotional standpoint um some of the nastiest dogs I've seen are terriers yes. because of how intense they do everything. Mm-hmm. And it's, it can, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming for owners, especially when you have a one that really has bad intentions. Yep. That's when I think some of the toughest dogs to crack mm-hmm. are, are those dogs and crack those cases down because they are so goddamn intense that it's like they will punch you in the face with things. I think of one very specific dog when I speak of pities and they're sometimes intent to harm and their intensity and I they're amazing working dogs if that's what you're looking for it's like insane because they're so intense but I I don't think they're apt for a normal house all of the time I like fostering I think we should shout out fostering oh my so god you can kind shout of try out fostering. it before yes. you try it before you buy it try it before you buy it yep. it's like it's you know if it's it, I back to like the emotional investment that people make with like I got this dog it doesn't really fit quite like I want it to with my kids or my significant other or my lifestyle and people feel so bad about having to give it well no I made this commitment I need to be with this dog forever instead of just you know kind of putting the ego to the side a little bit a little bit of ego but putting the emotions to the side and just saying this dog could have a better life Mm -hmm. right with somebody else so fostering great way to like hey I think that this dog would do really well and then getting a drivey terrier saying like you know, the driviness, like that dog needs a job that I can't provide for it. And I have a lot of clients that I say that your dog has a lot of drive. They're, they're like working, they need to be worked and people don't know what that means. Um, and that's something that like, it's okay that you don't know that it's okay that you don't want to work your dog every day, like train with your dog every single day, like intense training, like a, you know, a hit workout with your dog. That's fine. Give it back to the, you know, to the, to a different foster. Somebody else will grab it and you can try on another one yeah Mm. and I think that's one of the reasons why I fostered Darby first um because I think I knew I was looking for something pretty specific um and obviously something that also fit in my house with Owen being the way Owen is and my cat as well um and then I mean we even had a conversation when I got Darby because he came with a slew of things Mm -hmm. but he ended up working out, I guess. Well, I think I think one thing to add too, as far as you guys kind of talked about uh, rescues and shelters when they when they talk about breeds of dogs, uh, take it with a huge grain of yes. salt. My dog, mm-hmm. his his mom was there, and she was a full full blown Malinois in a shelter environment, and I I don't know what happened to her, and I can probably assume what happened to her because she was not the best with people. They labeled him as a lab German Shepherd mix, yeah. so they had one of the parents there and still mislabeled what the dog actually was. So I think that's one thing too is uh, don't don't take it by heart when they tell you it's this and then expect the dog to come out with those personality traits. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. So I've I've heard this thing a lot um, uh, over, you know, the past few years. Uh, the, the rescue called me and said that, or, or the breeder called, whatever, you know, whoever the, has the dog, called me and said they didn't that they were just giving this dog away or you know they were wondering they didn't have any adopters for this dog um do you want to take this dog too right and that like oh my god how can you say no oh god Mm -hmm. they called you called me and asked me if I wanted the last dog what if Mm -hmm. what if nobody else gets him what if nobody else takes him and then people come in with two dogs and they're like hey now we need help with our two puppies or two dogs that we have how'd you get these two dogs oh well it was kind of like a buy one get one thing Mm -hmm. or nobody else wanted this puppy holy Molly, that's intense. I think that's scary too. Like Kason said, when you are looking to rescue whatever it is, adopt from a shelter, you almost do have to be prepared for anything. Like, and and it comes with the aspect of these dogs take maybe three weeks to settle in and show who they really are. Um, y- you have to be prepared to almost tackle anything. Yeah, I think uh, if anybody's out there looking for a dog and they don't need it for specific reasons or 
whatever, um, just adopting a dog in general is a, a good idea. Mm-hmm. I think also too in the pit bull thing is I think they're just they're very overbred mm-hmm. um, because I think people don't take care of them sometimes mm-hmm. and they're they're living in bad situations which means they don't get fixed. It's like kittens, like that's why cats are like so overpopulated. It's because I think the pit bulls are just they're overpopulated for many different reasons and. Um, it's one of my favorite breeds Me ever too. to train because they perform so well and they want to do anything they possibly can to make you happy, which is what gets them in trouble sometimes. They'll do anything for people. And I think that that's just on the Pitbull thing. And I know that when I posted the dude with the dog sign, Pitbull sign, there was probably 300 c- comments of people talking about you know the breed and blah 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 and it was just like a generalized statement of like i still love them but i think they get miscategorized a lot Mm -hmm. and they're overbred so we see a lot of them in the shelters and and they're also like a very dominant genetical thing like if any if if a dog has any pit bull in it you'll see the pit bull Mm. it's like look at what is that called when it's when you have like brown hair it's it's a dominant gene is that what it's called Trait, yeah, Dominic yeah, Trait. That's we'll do some uh, Pitbull Punnett squares, guys. Oh. Yeah. I love Punnett squares. Uh, the other thing, too, I want to... The other thing I want to point out, too, is Julia runs my... Uh, a lot of my socials. So. Hashtag shout out influencer. Yeah, so oh when she... God. So I, I just want to be... Cl- <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear for anybody that's watching this or listening to this. She's being... She's being funny. She's not being serious about. She's trying to be funny. Yeah. About, about no, she's being funny. Squares. I just don't being want people. Funny to, about what? Well, like, when you say like you're an influencer or whatever, I don't I want people. Wouldn't say it on here. You did. You, you literally just you did. said it about no. 25 minutes no, ago. No, I said it TikToks. I, I said it TikTok. It doesn't girl. matter. It doesn't matter. My point that is. That means I could be watching TikTok. No, TikTok queen. I think you're. I'm just trying to give people context of why you said that, so you don't get looked at any other way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> What is that supposed to mean? I'm trying to stick Just up. Getting out ahead of it. I'm, I'm tr- yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure that you're, you're represented because the internet people are mean. Oh. All right, wow. this is a good one too. That and I'm looking at my, uh, my questions that had come in. This is a good one. Ball versus treats for rewards. Oh, well, depends. Depends on what. Depends on the dog, right? What yep. your drives are. Yep. But also, you know. Part of me wants to say it takes a great deal of talent to uh, work a dog on what I call an exterior reward, which is like a food or treats. But I also have seen clients recently like not get the concept of payment with food either. I think a lot of clients come in not having tried balance training before. And I don't know if you see this a lot, but I feel like I see it a lot where they're so over infatuated with the thought of correcting a dog that they forget to pay their dog which I, I feel like I see that a lot where people forget to use a motivator to get something that they want out of their dog. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I think it's just people are, it's a new thing that they're trying and the new thing that they're trying is the balanced aspect or adding corrections or punishment or whatever. So I think a lot of people forget you still need to pay your dog when they're doing something right or using food to teach concepts or whatever it may be. So I think that's one thing, but I think for, for toys versus food, when I'm teaching a dog a concept, it's always going to be food. Once mm-hmm. they thoroughly understand the concept, I'll tr- transition it to a toy, tug, ball, whatever. I think, too, that a lot of people have, like, an idea of what they want their dog to work for. Like, I can't tell you how many times, like, board and train-wise, I've gotten an email saying, well, I, r- I really want him to learn how to play fetch. Yeah. Uh, he might just not that might not be his jam like yeah sorry i see just a lot drives. of people right. uh try to reward their animal or their their animal um their dog with a toy or a tug or a ball and the dog has no real interest in it and playing tug um or or whatever with like engaging your dog with a toy reward is is a skill in and of itself um and just kind of like hanging it dead in front of their face and be like why won't they bite the ball like this is your reward and the dog's like nah dude i'm watching that thing over there so like if you're going to use a toy reward like do you know do your homework and look it up like how do you do this or ask trainers like i i go over a lot with people here's how to make the tug come alive because um people just don't grasp that concept in- initially like it's mm-hmm. just something that some people get it some people don't um and that you know if you're going to use a tug reward or a toy reward like make sure that your dog 
make sure it's a reward for your dog. Don't just kind of put it there and be like, ah, they didn't want it. All right, cool. But I use tug rewards. I use toy rewards for my dog. Keep your dog engaged. Yep. Yeah, I think it's getting all forced, Mickey. <gasps> I think Forrest. I think we call him right shout now. Shout out Forrest. I think um yeah, shout out Forrest. I think Shout out Forrest. At Forrest Mickey. The concepts of reward systems is so complex and we can go down such a rabbit hole. But I think we're I started calling ourselves the team here like lifestyle dog trainers cuz we're really not like super obedient trainers or super I mean we're everything, right? It's like like a lifestyle. Like we're training dogs for pet pet owners. That's pretty good. Yeah, I like that. that. I just cuz I was like it, it's like realistic lifestyle, it. right? Where it's like we are lifestyle trainers cuz we're not like cuz you'll go to a training camp and they may be super hard on obedience and they'll blow your socks off on like holy crap I didn't know all that stuff but then you're like yeah but what about the behavior I came for or vice versa somebody will go to a behavioral trainer and they'll teach you how to do certain things and then but then they won't teach you how to like like when I just work with my out-of-states every single dog that I had I had them sit down out front in the lounge in a realistic like environment at home and I had people walk in because that's what they were having problems with but I think reward systems in general is so in depth, but these questions are coming from dog owners and it kind of made me think of like the lifestyle training that we do. And I think the big difference is some dogs will have the drive for food and some dogs won't. Some dogs will have the drive for toys, which typically and historically is going to be predicated off of their prey drive. Everyone thinks like your dog loves ball. It's like, no, your dog loves chasing things and bringing it back to make it come alive again. So when you throw that ball, they're actually chasing the ball out of prey to kill it and then bring it back. They don't like the ball. It's just the only thing that moves. You could throw a sock out there. They're like, hell yeah. And then they'll bring it back to you. And I think we can get really granular on that. But I just think in general for the overall audience of pet owners, it's whatever your dog likes. But also there's some dogs, especially dogs that you haven't raised as puppies that you may adopt at some point that it's dangerous to play tug with. Mm -hmm. Possibly dangerous to have food reward if you're having resource guarding issues. But... Going back to what Kyle was saying really quick before I forget, I've also had a fair amount of clients on the other end of the spectrum of coming in on the balance of only ever correcting their dogs and never rewarding. And I think because there's different camps that are really loud, and that's what we try to focus on, like explaining actually what's going on, that we forget that there's also a lot of people and a lot of camps out there that are really heavy on corrections. And so when we come in, paying their dog is sometimes equally foreign to them, mm -hmm. where sometimes correcting may be foreign to some people. Um, but also, too, like today, I don't know if you guys heard me in your group class, but I had three dogs in my out-of-states, one from Western New York, one from North Carolina, one from New Jersey, and they all came in some of the most reactive dogs that we've had in a long time. Abby and I were talking about this. These dogs were the most reactive dogs we had in a long time. Spice. When I walked into the front room, we couldn't talk. Every single one of them was on a, well, not all of them. Two of them were at a muzzle. They had to go outside. It was nasty. But when they were in group class, they're walking. They couldn't, first of all, let me give you context. And these are videos you'll see on my channel at some point. But they couldn't be in the same room with another person, not one other person. Some of these people haven't had people over or friends over in four years, three or four years. They have bite histories. They couldn't be in the same room with one other person, let alone in group. We had 10 to 15 plus dogs, and they're walking through group silent. I'm like, guys, do you realize what you're doing? You have to reward your dogs. Talk to them. Communicate with them. Like, let them know if they're doing good. Let them know. We get it. A lot of dog owners get into fix-it mode. And I think they're so, because th these specific dog owners were lacking the balance, they did, they were only focused on rewarding the dog, which is why I think they got into so much trouble, like that Border Collie run the show, and it had been for three years because they'd never implemented any reason why not to. Once the dog started, like, he was blown away. He was like, holy shit this is insane i've ne and he was telling other people he's like i've never been able to do this and he's like picking his job off the floor but yet when he was walking forward he didn't make a peep to his dog so some people and i'm like you have no problem correcting your dog which is okay but you have to like the other even bigger side to this equation is payment and i think people get in such fix-it mode where if they're acting good they're like 
<laughs> hawk, if they're acting good, they're just silent, but then as soon as the dog does something, they're like, leave it, and then they correct the dog. I think if we, like, I I try to relate it to, to clients, like, in private sessions of, like, you know, their dog is doing something, and, and like you just said, like, they're just kind of not acknowledging it all. I'm like, this is what you want the dog to do. So I, I phrase it as, like, you know, your kid is, is learning to walk, and they're, like, cruising along the couch, and then they turn to, like, start taking their first steps. You're not like, ah, take three steps, right. and then I'll clap. You're like, yeah, come on, keep going, come on, come on, you're doing great. And you're like, there. Yeah. people get so excited, like, for, like, the process, and somehow that's lost when, like, the process is then shifted to, like, their animal. Because, like, I don't know if, like, they're just so in their head of, like, wait, I have to mm -hmm. stand here or hold my hand or do whatever. Um, but it just, it gets so easily lost. You know, like, yep. cheerlead yeah. your dog along when they're doing what you want them to do. Based off some conversations, especially, like, during go-home sessions um, with the board and trains, especially with, like, some really difficult dogs, whether really high energy or behavior cases... I feel like a lot of owners, when they see their dog finally doing something good, they're almost just like, oh, I'm going to let him be. I don't want to interrupt. They're finally behaving. Rather than reinforcing that and giving them a reward for that, I think they almost just try to be quiet and sit back and let it happen because they're finally enjoying their dog doing something right rather than encouraging it to continue. So I think some people don't know how to bring it out more and they kind of just, again, in that fix it mode, like, well, I have to jump on them when they do something wrong and they end up ignoring all of the good that does does happen and they focus on the, the things that they're really having problems with rather than kind of balancing mm -hmm. that scale back out. I would like to put a a little as asterisk, asterisk, exclamation point. Ex well, little. I know what you're saying. Little, a little mark, arrow, a little key. Uh, I did see. I say. I say this like cheerlead your dog, and then I think about this guy that I saw at the park the other day, and he was trying so hard to get his husky to sit. He's like, sit, 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 sit. His dog sits. He's like, good sit, and the dog jumps up out of the right. sit. So like, <laughs> I felt so bad. Um, and, uh, so so you know like good sit and then kind of disengage like mm -hmm. check in hey i'm still here good job you're still doing the good thing thank you for doing the good mm -hmm. thing but calmly like the the inflection of the of your voice as to kind of like meet your dog at the level that you want them to be at i think that 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 also uh will depend on what the action is too and i think some of that will be applicable to most standard obedience but when we're doing like recall and stuff it's the yeah. uh, it's the same thing you're like you're trying to encourage them and I always tell people, like, read your dog. Like, the guy out here put his dog into a down, the dog downed, and he did the same thing, and the dog jumped up. And I'm like, I, I hit him with, yes, that was great, but also it was terrible. So it was like a yes and no thing. So just, it's discretion. Like, everything is discretionary, but it's a good point. I think, too, on a very micro level, I think reward-wise, like, a lot of people, in a sense, like, forget to reward especially like younger dogs or if you're trying to encourage like a calmer state of mind or like settling i think people forget to reward their dogs when they're like yeah in a calmer state of mind like if they're wiggling and being silly and like looking at them they're like oh yeah good job yeah i'm like okay well if you want her to settle you're rewarding her now being a giant goofball which is like fine if that's what you want but like or like reward her when she's yeah. calm yeah Less is more. Less is more. Like when, like that's what I was saying to my out-of-state clients. They were all in group class and their dogs were just laying there chilling. And I'm like, so there's so many variances of rewards, right? When, whenever I tell my, my owners to like reward their dog, they, they're like, oh, shit, let me get the treats out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. You don't just touch your dog. Look at your dog. Talk to your dog. You don't Engage have. Engage with Yeah, there's dog. so many variances of rewards that you have to. You know, pick what's oh. right for your dog. You're sipping some um, podcast tea. Podcast, podcast tea. tea. Yeah, it's amazing. Some green chai. No bad dogs tea. Oh, pop off. I love chai. Uh, it's a green chai. It's not just chai. Oh, Looking sorry. at different questions. Sorry. Um, that's fine. Shout out to Gussie's owners, by the way. Oh, my gosh. They are Shout saints. out to Gussie's owners. We love Gussie. I told them that they could be guests uh, tonight, we today, should. if they wanted to. They thankfully said no and i said we have been here for simply too long <laughs> i said i said sarah come on come on the podcast girlfriend so we um <laughs> they live here now yeah we have, we have clients for those of you listening and watching that go over above and beyond probably what they need to do because they're just really invested into yes. their dog gussie if you guys have watched my e-collar uh introduction 
she is the the dog that we the German Shepherd that we use in that. And they were just here again for like the third time. And it's just nice to see people that are really invested because they're gonna get the most out of it. The most I ROI. Would li- return on investment. Ah! I would like to give them the most credit in the world for owning a working line shepherd in New York City. Big facts. Mm-hmm. And her being a quite lovely, balanced working line shepherd in New York City. She's a gem. She's a gem. I got we a love good, Gussie. <clears throat> got another good one. Somebody was basically uh, asking about litter mate syndrome and how that can affect their ecosystem that they live in with their dog. Go ahead, girlfriend. This is your bread and butter. Before is you, this or is <laughs> Before you butter the bread. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. This brings us to an- another That's conversation. No, no, no. We're not doing butter right now. <laughs> not doing that right now. I want to give context to what litter mate syndrome is for oh. people for people at home and people who are watching and listening. Litter mate syndrome is essentially adopting at least two litter mates. So a brother and a sister or sister or sister or whatever. And this is common and it create it can create problems and these guys we'll discuss it in a minute, but I just wanted to give context for people who had no idea what litter mate syndrome was. Also, I want to tell you something funny something. This is funny. When we were at the other facility. <laughs> oh, funny something. Yeah, because I was like so I was so confused. Zach, who's not here right now BB BB was he said he said to bread me it was we had a <laughs> we, yeah we had a Malinois bread and butter we had a Malinois in our board and train Kyle you probably remember this dog Bones nope I'll tell you in a second you might okay. remember it might be Bones I don't think it was stop though. stretching you look like you're in pain okay stretching, dude. you sound like you're in pain okay Hi, dude so <laughs> okay that, that is not. <laughs> you can't say that on the podcast. Up by your shoe. My muscles are tight. Well, Thank drink more water. Clarifying. Okay. Don't let him bully you. The Kyle. Malinois. Oh. Every, 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 every so day thing, man. Zach said. Oh God. Zach said he. This, oh, he's he's a singleton, and oh. at the time, I didn't know what it was, and I like learned recently, and I just played it off. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I thought first, my, <laughs> that doesn't shock me about <laughs> you. My initial thought was it's royalty. It was a no. It was a it's like a lot. It was a Malinois line that I was supposed oh, to know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he said singleton. I'm like, oh, singleton. <laughs> yeah. A singleton Malinois dude. That's gnarly. I was like, wow. Yeah. But I didn't realize the opposite of litter mate syndrome. <laughs> singleton is being a singleton is yeah. being uh, the only dog alive or the only dog born after birth. Yes. So litter mate syndrome. What do you guys think? Kyle, Gelsomini, Mr. Gelsomini. I was just going to add, I think a lot of people don't realize it's it's not just litter mates. It can be any dogs you get at the same <gasps> time. Yes. Or even what? dogs any... that are months or years apart. Like if they spend too much time around each other, there's separation anxiety. The biggest thing with litter mate syndrome is separation anxiety. Like that's what it creates, a, a codependency. From each other. For the dogs to be together. I mean, it's the same thing if you leave your house, your dog... Uh, has a mental breakdown because you're leaving. I mean, it can be very similar with those dogs. Yes, I, Julia. I think even with when you're getting litter mates, it can. Ma- I know. Now I'm talking. You guys are in trouble. What? Did you just pat me? Yeah. That was just excited that you're here. Oh, thanks, bud. <laughs> you're welcome. I think when you have two puppies or dogs that are very codependent on each other, yeah, it can make it that much harder for you to build a relationship with your dog. Oh, yeah, I've had clients where the relationship between the two dogs is way stronger than the relationship yes. between the owner and the dog. It's 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 sad as well. Yes. I think it's sad to see. Well, I think... I'd be pissed. I think my my experience with it is the dogs spend way too much time with one another, and they're too, they're too into each other. And yes. so when you're trying to train or you're trying to teach foundation, the dogs are like, Rawr, still going after each other. Because I think there's this fun puppyhood stage between four to eight weeks when you get your dog that they're constantly just roughhousing and playing with each other and having a good time and being puppies. And then basically when you adopt or uh, buy or purchase two and you go home with them, that continues. And they don't really know how to separate. And I think then pulling dogs away from their litter and putting them into a different system is healthy for them because then they can readapt and focus. And I think the biggest problem with litter mate syndrome is that, is the dog's are so into each other. Yes, there's going to be a codependency and some separation anxiety if they're separated because they were literally in a sack together and then born and then now we're separating them. But also, it's really it's like getting it's like putting these two in a classroom together. It's just not. Oh gonna, my god! Or in an office. 
Yeah, or here. Do, or they do good. have desks close to each no, they're other. They're doing too. good here. We're gonna make a excuse a conference. Me? We're gonna push all the desks together. In regards to the littermate syndrome, another thing that we see quite often is once they start maturing, fighting. Yeah. Quite a bit. Retweet. Which I, can cause other issues because then you either have to separate them or you have to create and rotate or hopefully they work through it with structure. Um, sometimes it can escalate very, very quickly and then you could be in a rehoming situation. So now you have a dog that has never been away from its litter mate with probably maybe some anxiety issues, could have behavioral issues, going to now a different home, and now they now have to work through those issues. So I, I feel like littermate syndrome, especially if they start going at it, can be really, really tough. I have four people right now that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, all dogs, littermates, um, Three of them, like legitimate litter mates. The sec, uh, the fourth person, has two dogs, um, same adopted at the same time, same age. Um, separation anxiety is this thing that I see the most of mm -hmm. at the age that they're at right now. Um, but uh, with the other dogs, with the yeah, from the other dog. Yeah. Um, one person, one of the people, were doing they. Uh, that was a you. That was you. You passed that down to me. Um, I know who you're talking about, yes. And they crated and rotated. So crate and rotate. They crated when one dog was out and milling around the house and having human time and family time. The other dog was in a crate. So crate and rotate. I say that. I, I feel like I say that to people. I say that to. I say that to my wife when I talk about getting seven more dogs and how we could manage that in our house. Relatable. Seven. Um, Not just one more dog. Just, uh, seven. Well. They're like seven I, on the docket, so I'm giving her ideas. And rotate. Um, Julie's a bad, in, bad influencer on, <laughs> on, her, on friends. Good influencer, probably on the internet. I'm sure. Well, that's that's debatable. So, I mean, create and rotate, creating one dog while the other dog has access to the house or or the family or whatever, and then you put that dog who has access to the to the living space back at a crate, and you let create a dog out. So, creating and rotating the dogs, um, and they did that for the first like year. Think almost or, uh, the last time I saw them, the dogs were just under a year, but they they stuck like pretty tried and true to that, which was excellent. Um, so I'm looking forward to catching up with them and seeing how the dogs are doing now. But they really put in a lot of work. Uh, they took everything that we gave them, the information, very seriously. Um, the dogs listened very well. I did like a two dog session with the dogs and the family here, and the dogs did really really well at listening to the humans because they were so proactive in making sure that the dogs if they did have time together it was short supervised it was never left alone oh yeah the dogs are out in the yard together oh the dogs are in the living room i think maybe so that was really excellent but um separation anxiety is the biggest thing that i see uh ignoring the human and like the um our sweet sweet shepherd boy uh just not meeting their mm -hmm. full potential the one that we have now no no oh. Um, so just not meeting like their full potential, just a little bit of anxiety. Like they'll, you know, they can, they can be really great, but it's kind of like, um, just, just, they had more to for, them. for idea on the shepherd that she is speaking about. I think he could have been a Gussie. He could. Like he was pretty darn close. wise engagement. He was, he was pretty darn close. One of my favorite think shepherds. He He's amazing. Like sweet, sweet personality. I would also like to go on record and say that no responsible breeder will give you litter mates or mm. rescue facts, which mm. is why earlier when I see all these people come in, I have two dogs. Uh, did you plan to get two dogs? No. The adoption agency called me and said that they had one left or it was the mother or it, or, oh, the breeder called me. Actually, the breeder, when I was there, said that this dog um, had, you know, um, a, a skin condition, not a skin condition, but something that was, like, really minor that they couldn't, like, sell the dog for the full price. So they gave it to the person for, a, like, a fraction of the price. Bogo. Um, it is, it, yeah, it's quite, I have a lot of people you that come what? in with Bogo dogs. Uh, here I am sitting here saying, you know what, I don't, don't do that. But guess who would do it? You're looking at it. Yeah. Like, well, take two? Well, that's what... No, I wouldn't take litter mates, but, like, if someone looked at me and was like, here's a... Pulling at your heartstrings. If you adopt from... Because you're an emotional... You, you're you an emotionally reactive person. Well, it's I, it's, it's, it's not... And a, I love dogs. It's not a business, but 
once a <laughs> once a rescue or organization knows that you've adopted before, you're the first person they're going to email when they say, "Hey, we got another cute dog." Yeah, I see it with my clients all the time. My clients will be like, "Oh, they emailed or they called and they said," and I'm like, "Well, you know, you also have opinions. You can say no, but I get it." Yeah. It's kind of yeah, I'm not good at that. But um, one, one thing I'll say about litter mate <laughs> syndrome too is it can also create a lot of. Uh, insecurities because mm-hmm. the dog doesn't have an opportunity to, to build confidence itself yeah. because they're constantly either and we see this a lot i even saw this with wolves when i when i was volunteering at the sanctuary they had litter mates from the um fl- a, fl- a zoo in florida and they had the wolves and one was confident and the other one was absolutely the exact opposite and I think for the for the dog that's coming out of like pushing the dog out of the nest at eight weeks to say, hey, figure life out. This is real shit. An insecure dog may never have that opportunity if they have their brother or sister that's like very, let's say, extroverted or maybe confident to say like, hey, like and then the other dog might like wiggle over and try to figure things out. It's kind of like bringing Kyle out in the wild. <laughs> like he has to- <laughs> Should we bring up the quiz? <laughs> no, we should not. That's not I'm no super social. Uh, but Kyle does. You know, Kyle's Kyle's coming out of his shell. He's getting better. We put him. We force him to work through low levels of stress. Shout out! Shout out! Franklin Alley in Troy, New York. Franklin Alley Social Franklin Club. Alley Social Club, aka Frog Alley. No, it's not. Frog Alley's in Schenectady. <laughs> And Franklin mm. Alley is in Troy, and it has floor shuffleboard, and you all made fun of me for playing sh- hey, floor shuffleboard. Hey, I played, and I did good. You did well. I won. You did well. I did yeah, well. You did cool. well. I did well. I do have a second yeah. Katrina's crate and rotate. I, I think that um, when people do get litter mates or two puppies or two dogs at the same time, I think it also becomes very easy to not separate them. Oh, both dogs are going out. Both dogs are hanging out with us in the room and they don't realize it can cause a problem until it already is a problem. And then you're really working from the other end and playing catch up. Um, so it definitely takes a, a lot of, you know, being proactive and a lot of effort and scheduling and figuring out how that would work. Um, but it is definitely an easy routine to get into of just having the dogs follow each other. They tire themselves out by playing and rather than, you know, really focusing on the relationship, they kind of just form it themselves and it can cause the, you know, the other problems we were talking about. But it definitely takes a lot of effort on the owner's end to be able to manage that. So definitely kudos to those owners who yeah, made just that think, commitment. Yeah. I just think in general, like, getting two puppies is hard. Yeah. Well, like, I, I yeah, I've, dude. I've seen it at certain rescues too where um, the uh, – and I think – Part of the issue with people that do get litter mates is they are always the type of people that overhumanize dogs, which mm-hmm. is usually a reason that they have both of them at the mm-hmm. same time. Facts. And I mean, I think their dogs would have issues regardless because I never would. They do don't implement structure. Yeah. They don't. They don't implement what they need to to raise a dog successfully. But I think even coming back to rescues, like I've seen when I was looking for my dog when uh, four or five years ago, whatever it was, like I saw multiple rescues that were like these dogs can't be separated because they're so attached to each other. So like, uh, it, yeah, it, like it stems there a lot of the times too. I will say it is one thing if the dogs have like historically lived together and got along and they aren't litter mates. Yeah. I, I think you, rescues can be like, yeah, they can live together. Yeah, like, I that think is that's, fine. that's fair. Because yeah. there's, there's dogs that we see all the time that their owners have passed away. Right, yes. Right. Like if, if they've passed away or there's a situation where they have lived successfully yeah. together in a family home previously. Wait, were you saying the ones, Kyle, what do you, and they're saying are you they're attention? going as a bonded pair. I think that's one thing. Are you saying that the ones in the shelter were litter mates that couldn't be separated or that they yeah, were just Yeah, they were, they were like four or five month old litter mates that Dang. they were like, they cannot be separated. And I was Dang, like, Dang, brother. Okay. So <laughs> like, like okay. theoretically speaking, they probably could. Well, it's a shelter, so they know. What yeah. The, the next question is the importance. No, that's not it. It was about tour. share your highlights from your tour and share a story that you're proud of. So we were on tour, and my favorite actor, Shia LaBeouf, as we, as we know, and there was, a vid- there was a YouTube short of him doing a teaching class. He kind of – Shia had this crazy life th- roller coaster, as we all do. Uh, and unfortunately, because he's famous, it, it's publicized. But he um, he basically is coming back out into the public and trying to get back into his craft of acting. And I, I like Shia because I think he's like hands down the most talented actor 
Well, I shouldn't say that. That's very That's, big. You're putting in yourself my, in a corner. Okay, y- you're right. And I don't want to do that because there's. I like a lot of other actors. Shia is the most uniquely creative actor that I've seen work. Like, I think when he's in movies, he, he, he just stands out. Like, there's a lot of really good actors. And you're like, wow, that's a really good role. Leonardo DiCaprio plays, like, so many different roles really well. Just for an example. It's kind of cliche. But Shia, I just feel like, is just so... Anyway. Scrolling through TikTok, or through Instagram, or Jesus. Scrolling through, what's it called? YouTube. 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 Yep, there and you I go. see this short of, says Shia LaBeouf training and com- or doing acting classes in Compton. And I click on it, and I'm like, that's where I did my seminar. So it's kind of cool for me to see that. And I feel like the world works in a really weird, strange way, where, like, out of everybody in the world and out of anywhere they could have been, my favorite actor was immediately in the venue that I just did a seminar in teaching a class in. Like, he could have been anywhere doing that. That was cool. That's just a side note on tour. But um, these guys weren't on tour, but... We went on, for those of you who don't know, we went on tour, uh, a U.S. tour in an entertainment bus. Abby was there. It was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. And I would say just um, being, my favorite part was going out and meeting the No Bad Dog Army people because the amount of people that, like, waited in line just to talk to me or take a picture with me and tell me how much I've helped their, their dog gives me a lot of inspiration and ammunition because, as we know, the dog training industry Any industry can be very toxic if you're a creator on any space. And sometimes it gets discouraging to be a creator in this, in any space if you know, because you just have a lot of people trying to bring you down. And when I was on the road, we had so many people just coming out and pouring their heart. And so like people drove hours, like there was this one guy when we were in Oregon drove like three and a half, four hours to just come and say hi with me. And I and I I was so embarrassed by this because he I was like, Do you want to like take a picture or anything? He's like, No, I'm really shy. I just wanted to meet you. And I was like, Wow. I'm like, that is like really cool. So I think my my best part was creating memories with my with my with my family and friends on tour. Um, spending time just meeting new people and, and visiting and what a great opportunity and I'm so grateful to be able to travel the country and actually be able to do that and people show up. It's pretty cool in every single stop that we did. So that's my, just like my synapses. I, I learned so much. Being on a tour bus, not sleeping, being in a different state, and, you know, we have our baby on board. We had f- three or four other people on board. And I was against the resistance band the entire tour because I'm waking up literally with little to no sleep um for a magnitude of reasons and then getting out and doing a full two-day seminar or a full day training session on very little resources i'm not like in my house waking up you know making a smoothie in my house and like you know rolling out coming into my facility being able to grab staff dogs being able to grab it was like it's like when you're working out and you have that resistance band and then when you get back here i'm like this is the easiest thing i've ever done so but tour so thank you shout out to anybody that came out to tour and supported it because it's it took an enormous amount of logistics and an enormous amount of time and money and energy to make that happen and i now know why nobody else has ever done it <laughs> because it is a, it was a challenge but i'm glad that we did it because it was a it was really cool to just meet people so that's just somebody asked about that and that that was i mean that was a big part of my life for about 6 months anyway um, but the Shia thing was pretty cool, <laughs> only because he's my favorite actor. Uh, we'll leave it. We'll we'll talk about this last subject, and then we'll all go do our lives. This is very a huge conversation. We could all probably add. It's a very basic question, but I think also important questions. And sometimes I think I personally always forget. Like I'm like, oh, not everybody knows that, but it's really important. So, what's the importance of physical and mental stimulation in dogs? Um, so for, for anybody listening and watching, I'll give you context and then we'll talk about it. Physical stimulation is the dog in motion, right? So like Lakota is probably not in motion outside right now. She's probably just standing there. <laughs> staring at the ball. Staring at the ball, <laughs> waiting for somebody to throw it. She's <laughs> hyper Yeah. So physical stimulation or, you know, physical movement is running, chasing, et cetera, hiking, walking. 
And then the mental stimulation is going to be th the thinking processes. And so it's something I talk about like probably every day. Um, but it's super important because, you know, we did the do with the dog sign again with a dog needs more than a backyard. Because I think a lot of people think even if, yeah. So go ahead, pick it up. Well, I think this ties back into what we were talking about earlier is that like a lot of people don't know what working your dog means. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will respond to that with, well, we go on five mile walks every day but that doesn't really do anything for their brain. And I think, I mean, if you think about it, and this is kind of how I put it when people are, we're talking about like your dog needs more mentally and sometimes it's more beneficial and they'll tire out faster if you work on mentally. How are you after a day at school? Right. I was wiped and I wanted to go take a nap and you I was do homework. You also went to a... And but school. I also did normal <laughs> yeah, high I know. school classes. It doesn't make sense. At college school. I did normal classes. Well, that's good. I also think too that <laughs> the mental so the so I, I think that there's some obvious things that like it's different with people, right? So I guess cuz some people will be like, "Why well, I, I like for me one of the biggest mental things for me is running and like doing cardio, like getting my blood pumping and like if I'm super anxious or I have a lot going on and I can't think and I'm like overwhelmed, if I just run, I feel better and then I can have clarity. And so that's different with humans, but animals are, I think animals in general, not just dogs, are completely different because they're built to run for miles without even blinking. Like they're like, what, what are we doing next? So I just want to throw that out there that mm -hmm. there is a significant difference, obviously, and I, you know, obviously between mental physical simulation because they are very much connected with humans especially for me like if I feel any type of way emotionally for my mental health I'll hop on a treadmill and do a couple miles and be like okay now I can like if I have a big project or something and I can't put my thoughts out there I'll just go for a run and think after that so just want to throw that out there I think going off of the you know working your dog and the you know mental exercise I think it looks different for every dog too I mean for example, Julia and her dog Darby tried rally, which is, you know, an AKC sport, wasn't fast enough pace for him. They tried agility, which is, you know, also on the physical aspect of things, but using their brain to figure out the, you know, obstacles in the course um, was, you know, faster pace and better for him. Kyle with his dog Tuco does, you know, more competitive obedience, work with the ball and rope, tug, stuff like that. Um, so every, and you know, Co and Murphy with the bike and like, that's fun for them. And also they have to be aware of where the bike is. Like there's definitely a lot of variety in the mental exercises. And I, I know a lot of people, especially, um, kind of, there's a movement on social media of like enrichment toys. And those are really, really great, especially like for puppies. Um, but sometimes that's not enough for higher drive dogs that are supposed to be using their brain for hours a day. Um, so I, I think there's also a lot of, you know, availability with even just fun sports. You don't have to be competitive by any means, but there's a lot of different games that you can play that does both physical and mental that can really help tire out your dog and give them an outlet that they need. I think like, what's the question? What's the difference or just the benefit? What, what's the benefits what's of the, both? The benefits of both. Um, benefits of both. Uh, like I mentioned, like Murphy, I would run him like five miles a day so that he could be in a mental state where, like you were saying, Tom, like he's like, okay, whew, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. I'm a hound mix. I'm not going to howl anymore. I'm not going to whine anymore. So then he was in like a state of mind where he was ready to like receive information and I could train with him to do things, um, you know, obedience wise or, you know, sneeze or whatever, and like whatever <laughs> dumb stuff, like dumb shit. Um, but the... There comes a point, like, when, when I talk to people, or I get a lot of, like, puppies, right? So I'm trying to, like, highlight mental stimulation, especially for the days or days when you're not feeling well, when it's crappy and it's upstate New York and it feels like in a real winter, it feels like negative 20 out or something like that. Or it's just a wash, like a rain all day. So how can you tire your puppy out if you're not going to put him outside, if you're not going to take him on a walk? Or if it's just not in your lifestyle to go for walks, right? You have kids, you have jobs, you have other stuff to do. Um, so mental stimulation, like the, like how can you get your dog to use their brain? Say feed out of enrichment, 
especially for people that I, I know realistically, like people aren't going home and just drilling their puppies. Do I wish they would? Sure. But I know that like, that's not realistic. So I'm like, Hey, how can you capitalize on, on getting them to work their brain in other ways, make them work for all their food out of enrichment feeding items. Um, try some out here. I have, we have some great ones here that we, that we like to try. And, um, I, I like to compare it to giving your dog just physical exercise or when I was running Murphy just five miles a day, if I continue to do that, that, you know, after a while I have to run them six miles a day or seven miles a day, I'm just creating like a, a, I'm conditioning an athlete. So if I don't have a balance of physical stimulation and mental stimulation, I'm just putting myself at like in a worse position. Like I'm not setting myself up for success where I can work a little bit of physical exercise and a little bit of mental stimulation. And then I still have time in my day to go do whatever I want to do and not just be, oh crap, now I have to work my dog all freaking day long. Yeah, I saw something probably on TikTok the other day that basically tied exercising your dog to like conditioning an athlete. Like yeah. athletes train by doing more and running more or whatever it is. Um, and if it's going to be similar for your dog, if you continue to run your dog five miles a day, you're going to have to do six, seven miles a day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think especially from the be behavior standpoint of things, when we have dogs that have behavioral issues, I think people don't understand that a lot of it stems from their dog, not usually lacking a lot of mental people are pretty good about the physical because it's pretty obvious if if honest and quite honesty it's like it's not hard I think everyone knows if you have a dog you need to walk your dog run your dog do all that type of stuff but like I think the biggest issue and the biggest thing people don't realize is how many behavioral issues stem from a dog not having mental enrichment and mental stimulation um I mean the easiest way to put it for like humans if you're anxious emotional you, you're probably not going to make a good decision so if you have a reactive dog that is not works their brain and ever uh, or not enough they're not going to make a clear level-headed decision when you get into one of those kind of oh shit situations where oh my god there's another dog that turned the corner or whatever it is I mean I had a dog yesterday I think I was telling you about the pit that I had come in yesterday that she's she like hyper hyper fixates on dogs and uh, uh, and she's she can get pretty intense which is not surprising for the breed um we did 10, 15 minutes of obedience when they first came in. And at first we were doing simple stuff, sit stays, whatever. She could not sit still because she was so jazzed from coming in here and they did not work her at all before coming in. As soon as we kind of gave her clarity as far as what we were looking for and even uh, honestly tired her out a little bit mentally, she could think a lot better. So it's like, I think people, people don't realize how much that can help with behavioral issues, which obviously is like the majority of what I see here is, is dogs with behavioral issues. So like I, I stress it to people, I'm like, you might not have fun doing X, Y, or Z with your, some people don't have fun doing anything with their dog, which is like, why, why have a dog at that point? But even like some people don't like working the obedience and they don't like doing whatever. So it's like, find something, you, you should work the obedience regardless, but that's not the only way to get mental enrichment. So I, I tell people when they ask, I had a client ask me, we want to go to a place like 20 minutes north of here and try like dock diving and agility and sled pulling and whatever. And she's like, do you think that's a good idea? And I'm like, if your dog likes it and you have fun with it, go do it. And I'm like, it's, it's not going to hurt doing those things. I'm like, if you guys are both miserable doing it, I, I wouldn't continue doing it because that's not going to be fun. But I think the most underrated thing for the mental side of it paired with the physical is just giving your dog a clear state of mind as far as being able to make better decisions because it can help guide them a lot. Yeah. So like Kyle was saying is, there's like a <clears throat> gas tank that every dog has mentally and physically. And a lot of dogs, like you were seeing with my working line shepherd that I had in this out-of-state, they didn't have fulfillment. The dog didn't have fulfillment. <laughs> so, sorry, Hawk's, Hawk's barking. Uh, Hawk's our shop dog that... You think he's just barking because he wants attention, or do you think he's barking for a reason? Yes, no, he is the man barking. Yeah, no, I know, but, like, do you think he's barking because he... No, he's pissed that we're in here. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so I was just saying, like, every dog has fulfillments that they need, and every breed is going to be different, like we talked about. But I think the, the biggest difference for pet owners out there between mental and physical stimulation and how important they are is fulfillment. If you have a dog that... Um, every dog, like, at a baseline outside of the outliers of giant breeds like my St. Bernard when he was alive like he'd do one block around one walk around the block and he'd be done and but Lakota my other dog she needs both so she needs physical chuck it stimulation to get her lungs going because she's very like hyper but she also needs mental stimulation to test her 
So oftentimes we get clients that will go into what I call a circus. We had it to, we had it today where I was like, challenge your dog. Your dog needs another job. Your dog needs some sort of outlet to think of something different because you're stuck in the same routine. Your dog is simply bored. You're not giving your dog enough mental stimulation in order to be happy, which then creates anxiety, reactivity. Leash reactivity is the number one thing that that'll create because the dog literally is so bored. And when they go out, they're constantly scanning, looking for something to react to, which means the dog owners don't have any engagement, which is mental, right? And they don't have any control, which is also mental. So the mental stimulation is asking your dog to sit and stay, throwing a ball out, and then recalling your dog backwards instead of sending them to the thing, right? So they're thinking, they're, they're constantly, it's a test. So the more you test your dog mentally, the more that that gas tank is going to start to go down and your dog will find more fulfillment, out of all our all of our dogs will know our dogs need a certain amount of fulfillment and if they don't get it i think more importantly on this topic that's where you're going to see a lot of dogs especially all the dogs in the shelters are put into the shelters because people get dogs just thinking that they're our companion they're supposed to be around the house be good with the family and then you get a dog that needs fulfillment then what they do is they chew on the furniture they they bark, they become reactive. Uh, I've seen a lot of breeds get very, very, very uh, reactive at the house because they're taking the job of protecting or resource guarding because they're literally just so bored. They're doing nothing all day. I think I think one thing to add to that, if, if you're not going to mentally fulfill your dog, they will find something to mentally fulfill themselves with. I mean, they're going to go dig in the backyard. They're going to do a lot of nuisance behaviors, and a lot of people are like, why are they doing this? I'm like, well, what do you do with your dog? And they're like, yeah. nothing. I'm like, well, that's why your dog is seeking things to do. But I think also on top of that, um, as far as like how important mental – stimulation is i mean i think same thing with lakota tuco like any of these really high drive high energy dogs i could throw a ball for tuco for an hour if i make him work for it i work him for 20 minutes and he's gassed for a couple hours so it's like i mean they'll, they'll recover really quick from the physical most yeah. of the time especially once they get conditioned to it uh the mental I mean, if you, even if you have a really, really cracked out dog, I mean, maybe you'll get a couple hours of, of chill out of them. Um, but it's like the, the recovery time is much different for dogs as far as most dogs, especially once they're conditioned, they're in good shape. If you have obese dogs and dogs that have never done physical things before, it's a different story. But like these dogs that were bred to run and, and sprint and be fast and agile and all that stuff, it's if you work that mental too you will see a huge difference as far as that kind of time after you work them as far as how long they're calmer for they can think a little bit more clear-headed for a post if you just run them you're going to be out there every two hours running the dog or every hour running the dog yeah we've had a um a handful of dogs come through and um talking to the owners about you know struggling with you know their dog's mental state and relaxing and and we have one here right now um who oh She's lovely. And um, one of the things that I've heard consistently from the owners with the same issue that they have, you know, a higher drive dog, obviously with also a lot of energy um, and that they, they do really try to get that physical energy out hours, walks, chuck it zoomies in you know a fence in backyard and they, they say that sometimes they almost feel like they come back in and they think that they should be exhausted but they're actually acting worse and because it almost seems after that is that they still can't settle their brain but they're exhausted so they're almost like cranky in a sense so you see some mouthiness some maybe brattiness um almost like resistance mentally to like really settle down because their brain is still going a million miles an hour but now they're like kind of also physically exhausted on the floor so that I've heard from a lot of owners is you know what they struggle with even after they have exhausted their dog physically they just still have that you know mental aspect that they it just really can't relax and that's where we see so much anxiety come you know come through I think like going off that uh zoomies like I took my dog for a, a, a nice long walk and we came back and they just did zoomies like yeah they're they're overstimulated like go give them something to decompress go put them on a place and let them relax go give them go put them in a crate go give them a bone to chew so they're chewing they're de decompressing like um you know to me if a, if a dog is coming in from outside and they are just doing zoomies and going nuts I'm you need to go settle. You need to go decompress. I'm going to put you in a structured settle on a place, or I'm going to put you away and you can go chew on a bone or, you know, just in a separate room if they're an older dog or something like that. But yeah, that's a lot. Well, I think, I think one thing 
that I I talk to a lot. Sorry, Julia. Um, I talk to a lot of my clients about is is teaching teaching your dog what mindset you want based on the situation they're in. So for me, very much like ever since I've had Tuco, who was my dog, and he was a little under three months when I got him, it's been very clear of like when we're in the house, we're chilling, and that's the expectation. Obviously, it wasn't there right away, and he he was a crazy puppy. Um, but I think it's very clear to define when it is time to quote unquote, turn it on and get overstimulated in a controlled manner. So when I work my dog, he is overstimulated, but he's very controlled. I know yesterday, I know some of you heard him for whatever reason, he was extremely leaky and, and loud yesterday when I started working him because he was very pent up for whatever reason. Um, and he was very over, much overstimulated, but he's very controlled. So that's a big thing for me that I really preach to my clients is, is condition the mindset you want your dog to be in based on the situation you're in. Uh, I personally don't want my dog running around the house, playing with things, playing fetch, playing chase, playing all these crazy games. So that's something that I've set that standard for since he was a puppy. Uh, we go home and he just lays down and sleeps on the cot or on the couch or whatever. And it's because I've hammered it in from such a young age that it's like, this is what we're doing here on walks. You can be excited, but we're not getting the zoomies. We're not flying around. We're not pulling on the leash. So setting boundaries and structure and all that stuff. But I think it's very important for people to differentiate for their dogs what is expected of them from a mental and physical standpoint in each environment. Because I think a lot of people don't do that. They have toys out. They play fetch in the house. They're like, why is my dog running in the house? It's like you're playing fetch with your dog in the house. So they think it's a play zone. Mm -hmm. Why are they tugging on my shirt? Because you've been play wrestling with them since they've been three months old. And they think you are the toy now. So it's very much conditioning that as well. But when it's time to turn it on and, and let them be a dog and when it's time for them to shut it off. And obviously genetics come into play as far as if you get a crazy, crazy, crazy high drive dog, their off switch is going to look very different than certain dogs off switches. So yeah, Lakota's off switch is only, she knows like in, in my schedule, like when it is and it's at night when we're like getting ready for bed, she'll go and she'll lay down. And I think like a perfect example is right now, like what Hawk's doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on cue <laughs> like I don't know if they can hear that through the microphone but <clears throat> he he's a Malinois so for those of you who don't know Hawk he's the ours our shop dog and like he's doing that because he's like if we would have run him and worked him he would have probably been sleeping but he's just frustrated the other thing I'll point out is just overall mental and physical stimulation at a scale is a lot of like our principles as professionals as balance like a balanced dog training to me doesn't always necessarily mean the tools that we use or our methods. It means our whole ecosystem of like what dogs want. Cause there's some people are like, be free, do what you want. Um, free range, you know, I don't care what you do. And that's not having a balanced life. And I think balance, um, for mental and physical is very clear. Like for an example, we'll see certain things out of dogs if they don't get that. Look, my dog Lakota is a perfect example she is a KNPV line, Dutchie, that has all working lines in them. And so she's very serious about work. And when she doesn't get work, you can see it. Greta knows that firsthand. Uh, the other day we were in here and Lakota's, Lakota didn't get worked or ran for like three days. And I could just feel she was, we, we were traveling, go figure, and we were in and out and we had dog walkers and all these things going on in our system. And Lakota was like, hey, can you please, can I, can I just, can I, I got it, I got it. And I just can see it in her. I can feel it in her. She's just pent up. She's frustrated. And the other day she really wanted to go out and throw Chuck it. And she's just like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And she was in here. And then Abby and Greta opened the door and Lakota just looked at Greta and was like, bam, screw you. And just tackled her through the door. And they, it was fine, but she never in a million years, I think Zach or maybe even you, Kyle, was like, I've never seen her do that. She, in a never in a million years, if she was fulfilled, she never would have done that to Greta. She would have been like, she would have looked at her and I would have said, Lakota, come. She would have came to me. But she's like, I got to do something. 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 Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. But she's been like that for a couple of days. So <laughs> when that opportunity came, she took it. She's like, I'll do this then. And we see that in a lot of our clients. Mm -hmm. They come in with this really pent up dog and they're like that. Shepherd's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. The dog is maliciously barking because she has nothing else to do. She has no job. She has no fulfillment. She has nobody being like, hey, do this, do that. They're just, she's just living as a pet in the house and certain breeds are not going to do well with that. I think something that's been easy um, or, or at least for some clients that I've had recently for them to conceptualize like fulfillment wise 
like, why is my dog doing this? And it's like, well, I don't remember, you know, it's like their first time owning a dog as like real adults, right? And they like go and like adopt a dog or like get a dog from a breeder or wherever. And they're like, why is my dog, why is my dog doing this? Like, I want, I want my dog to go everywhere. Why are they acting like this? Well, because when like, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years, like however old you are that time ago, most likely your dog, your family dog growing up, you open the door, they go outside, they buzz off. And then at night you're like, Hey dog, come back in. And they go out and they fulfill themselves, right? They would like go and like find things to do, like not in a fenced in backyard area. And now we're asking dogs to go to bars with us and to sit on at coffee stores with us and to go to pet stores and to go to, you know, like Orvis and all, L.O. Bean and all these pet stores or like stores that are dog friendly. And we're like, why can't they just, why are they pulling toward all, why are they doing all these things? It's because your dog is like your fur baby and like your, your, you know, you got like, you know, I don't know, like a blinding Australian cattle dog sticker on your car. You love your dog so much, something, just for an Ooh. example. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 we're like why are they acting out it's like because we're not fulfilling them in a way that like they that were that we're remembering of our, like our childhood dogs that they had access to do different things and the access that we're giving our dogs is not something that they would naturally do like it's not natural for your dog to just you know you have to train your dog if you want them to sit and settle at a place at a, at a store with you or at a, like a coffee shop or a bar um you know why does my dog pull to every i want my dog to be a bar dog um cool they they we shouldn't let them be pulling toward everybody. You know, that's not normal. So Yeah, a dog seamlessly being able to coexist in public is is not as simple as putting your dog on a leash and walking out in public. I mean, that's that's why, you know, service dogs go through the training that they do. Um, and it, it takes years, you know, and it takes a really long time and it's and it's difficult and it's, you know, not made for every dog and that and that's okay. Um, my dog, my personal dog, is not that dog um she can't go out in Mojo's public like that, that. no she's not that dog no. um Mojo Jojo. Mojo Jojo um but you know and it, it takes a lot of you know that training that that mental work um you know really the expectations in different environments and you know teaching them those things it's it's not you know always super easy to just expect your dog to coexist with everything and anyone and in every environment and have that you know control and trust in them to handle that situation mm -hmm. for sure yeah, and like what Katrina was saying, it's just the amount of dogs that are unfulfilled that end up euthanized or in shelters. It's such an it's such an easy concept to fix. I don't want to say it's easy to fix. It's just such an easy concept. The amount of dogs that come in like so crazy, and we just like prey pull them around or put them on a treadmill, and then they can think, and then that, for the first time in their lives, they're like, "Oh, me, sorry, me," and they're able to like actually conceptualize different things and go through training and I think that that's a lot of people's issues is they get dogs predicated off of their looks or whatever and they get like a like you know the border the border collies uh, or the movies that come out with the mallies like that's the reason the reason why I shouldn't say that I, I've done some pretty cool podcasts with some animal trainers in Hollywood and they don't they they actually use a lot of there's actually organizations and uh, production companies that only use sheltered dogs um, but you know, the Malinois military movies, though, like those, if you're watching, it's like, it's like if you're watching those people, like, do you expect to also be like one of those Navy SEALs and like bust down Osama's door? Like, if you're not expecting to do that, then don't get a dog to also try to do that. I think that's what happens is they're like, that dog is really cool. But what they don't realize is those dogs are capable of being cool. And it takes a very skilled individual to get them to that point. Like you see this movie, this action movie of this guy fishtailing around a corner and, you know, going off this jump and like, it's like they're trained professionals. They've worked their whole life for this. And when people get certain dogs that make them look like that, I think people are like, oh, I want one. Like, yeah. like it's some sort of like cookie on the shelf. They're like, that looks good. Mm. And it's an instant thing. And then you get this, and not, not just Malinois, we just see it all the time, especially with Border Collies because they're so glamorized because they are so intelligent. And people are like, I want a smart dog. I'm like, do you though? <laughs> like, yeah. would you rather just have a simple tin dog over here that just like wants like a quick little run around the block, you know? And I think too many people are getting dogs based off of their looks. That's a really pretty dog. I think shepherds, Australian shepherds, Australian cattle dogs, any sort of herding breed, 
will people will get it based off of what they look like. Which is fine. But you have to be prepared for right. what's coming. Do your research. Right. If yes. people, like, like I can't wait to have Adam and Susan and Chris. I love a spotty dog, but, like, I also know what's coming with that spotty dog. Yeah. All right. That's why I'm, like, excited to. For clarification. Australian cattle dogs. Yeah, I was like, Dalmatian? Yeah, so no. I, I'm yeah. clarifying on the you Dalmatian. Want a Dalmatian? Nope. I'm all set with that. You got a Dal breeder lined nope. up? No. Nope. Okay. mini dolls. No. No. I'm all set. Thanks. So at some point we'll have, like, the PSA group on the personal protection dogs where they can really talk about their experiences because they because if you get a dog with specific goals like that's what i was saying earlier is if you don't have any like real like oh i you know i want to go hiking buddy go to the shelter like there's a hundred bazillion dogs in the shelter that would love to go hiking with you but then there's other people that are doing specific jobs like military jobs or they want to do psa and they want to do ring sports and genetically speaking that's their life like we know our people in our psa group and that's their life like outside of working dogs, they clock in nine to five and then they get right to the field and their whole lives are, which is amazing. And, but those are the types of dogs that, you know, people should get for certain things. Cause you're going to get, you know, like a dud and you're like, all right, now what do I do this? And I, ha- I see that all the time with the hunting stuff. The amount of, excuse me, the amount of dogs that are like washed out of hunting programs cause they don't have drive is so quick. And I think the general population of pet owners would be disgusted by it. But the reality is, is they're like, this is my job. Like I get paid. For, this is my livelihood. This is what pays my bills and puts food on my kid's table. If my dog can't go out and find X, Y, and Z, that's my life. And so I think that's probably in a whole nother podcast, but it's huge. You can say something, Kyle. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of on topic, kind of <laughs> off topic. It was on topic a minute ago, but then we, we all went on rants. I think podcast, I think like one of the biggest things is don't, don't put unrealistic expectations on your dog either. Like, I think mm-hmm. that's one of the things that I that hurts me the most to see from people. I think we could go to the flip side and, like, people don't put enough expectations on dogs that should have higher expectations and can do some really cool stuff. But, like, I mean, a lot of people, like, I think they see they see my dog work. They see Lakota. They see these, these dogs that are super, super crazy obedient and like have fancy flashy obedience and and i mean i do it just to have it i I have fun training it with my dog i think doing more precise obedience is fun it's enjoyable to me but it's like uh, people see that and they always ask me like how long did that take Mm -hmm. and i'm like he's five and he's like keeps getting better at this stuff i'm like it it wasn't like it's not an overnight thing either it's like i think i think people see that stuff though and they glamorize it and i think again like I think this could be a whole nother conversation for a whole different podcast, but I think society and what, what especially social media has placed a, an unfair standard on a lot of dogs, but I also think it's placed a very unrealistic image in a lot of people's heads about what a dog should be, whether it's every dog should be friends with everyone or every all these mouths are super social or every pit is a fantastic every terrier is a fantastic nanny dog. And like, I think that's a whole different conversation, but I think a big thing is like, don't, don't put unrealistic expectations on your dogs. Cause it's, it's unfair to the dog. You're setting them up to fail. And it's like, you're not going to give them the best life they can have if you're putting those unrealistic expectations on them. But it's also, it's not going to be a fun relationship with your dog. If you're trying to get your dog to love a ball, but they just want to go and do scent work and sniff everything. It's like, that's not going to be a fun relationship. It's not going to be a fun way to live. It's going to be very frustrating. It's going to be a tumultuous relationship between you and your dog. So that's a big word. Thanks. Yeah. We've been doing a, a dictionary, recently. <laughs> dictionary d- word a day. We did one the other day. That was, that was just in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I was off the off. <laughs> smart like that. Yeah, educated. I think I'd say too is like going on that social media thing. Obviously, being a creator in the space and making my career or part of my career on social media. There's, <clears throat> there's also, how do I say this? There's also like I see a lot of videos of really fancy shit that people are doing with really high bred dogs. And they're just like doing really cool camera work and music over it. And mm-hmm. it looks beautiful and it's sick as hell. But I'm kind of like, oh shit. <laughs> I, yeah. hope, I hope that certain people don't see this. Or I, hurt, I hope that the general public understands like, you know, you see this. And it's, it's popular in Europe too. And you get people stateside doing it too where they do like these. It's likes. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about like beef. Like so social media, I would say three or four years ago was – strictly um entertainment and also content and education now 
you just have to like have a cool looking video and what you're doing could be kind of proprietary to what you're doing, but nobody else can benefit from it. My point is, is when you glamorize a really cool looking video with the dog doing really cool shit, the amount of people that are looking at that, it could be dangerous because of the same reason, like that can get the same amount of views because the way that the algorithm works is you put out a movie with Channing Tatum and people are going to go see it because it's a big blockbuster movie. But when somebody gets really like a big video on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, or whatever, it's going to go to dog owners ex only. And some people are going to buy those dogs because they're like, well, I saw this mm -hmm. group of people doing X, Y, and Z. And that's also another good point too, though, talking about social media is yeah. it's changed. So it's good and bad, right? Because I'm able to do things like this and help dog owners get better. Like, oh, that's cool. I didn't realize about these things that we're talking about. Same thing with like video content, but it also can hurt situations for that reasons too, is you'll get, you'll get certain people that will like make these really flashy videos of these dogs that are not, not good dog pets at all. Yeah. And people they're like, I want, and they're looking at their Cocker Spaniel at home, like sleeping on the floor. And they're like, oh, look at that, like fancy healing and the dog busting through a door and biting somebody's face off. They're like, and that's also, that's probably another topic too, about like, I think we talked about this last podcast where or, I can't remember. Somebody said, somebody said literally they're like, I just wanted to be badass with like a cool dog and oh shit. And that's becoming a thing too, is people want this image of, I want this really sc scary dog. Scary dog privilege. Yeah. And they get it. And then they're like, the dog's an asshole. And then you're like, that's why you got it. Right. Yeah. Like don't you mess with the bull, you get the horns. And that's also a thing too. So it's just all a kerfuffle. Yeah, yeah it's a well, kerfuffle. I don't, I don't think yeah. people understand that's how much word. work truly goes into getting a dog to that level. Mm -hmm. That's like, what I mean. Yeah, it, it's because I. I mean, it's the same with anything on social media, though. You see the end yeah, product, true. but I mean, it's you see the. I saw. I forget where I saw it, but it's like especially with TikTok popping off now and how popular it is. It's like everything is that instant gratification of mm -hmm. like you don't see the mess that goes into getting what you have at the end. Mm -hmm. But I also think a lot of it is. People jump into things and are very um, impulsive. They're very impulsive, yeah. Um, and they they don't want they don't realize how much work goes into it, and they don't want to put in the work. They don't have the time to put in the work. They don't know how to put into the work. And it's like, even with people that that want to and will put in the work, it's like you still have to know how, especially if you're getting that high octane of a dog, because it's like yep. you can very 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 quickly mess that dog up by doing one little wrong thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, I, there are some great people on like Instagram and TikTok that I follow that they they have mal puppies or duchies or shepherds or corsos or whatever and they're they're pretty in t insane intense dogs and they document like the yes. whole process on That's social media just... and they, they don't just clip the ugly shit out they show the ugly shit mm -hmm. and it's like and even then people go after them for like oh well why is your six-month-old mal reacting at someone on the street or like a loud sound and it's like it's it's just even if you post that stuff it's still people no matter what you do you can't make people happy but it's like those people i think are, are doing a really good job at, at documenting it's like this is not all rainbows and it's like yeah. these dogs are f crazy and, and they're not for everyone but it's cool to have people actually posting the process instead of just showing the end result of this cool cracked out year and a half two-year-old three-year-old mal that's been through years of training at that point. And I mean, I've put in countless hours with my dog since I've gotten him. People ask, and I'm like, I, I can't count how many hours I've trained with my dog. It was like, it's an every, I still do it every single day, but especially when it was a puppy, it was like three, four sessions a day where it was like however long working on little things and big things, state of mind and all of it. So it's like, people don't realize the importance of training from an early age, but people don't realize that it just, it doesn't come out of thin air. Some, you get lucky sometimes one yeah. in a million, you get a lab or whatever, whatever breed it is that just follows you around, loves everything, never is on a leash, recalls perfectly. And you've never done any training with it, but like people get that dog once too. And then every dog they get after that should be that dog. And then mm -hmm. it's just whole, whole unfair expectations from a dog you had in the past. And why isn't my new dog like that? Uh, so I think that's part of it too, is like people put expectations from their past dogs on their new dogs, which I think th that hurts a lot for me because I, it's like, I get why people do it, the emotional part behind it, but it's, it's really unfair to the dogs and it's, it sets the dogs up to fail and it sets up for a bad relationship and the dog going to a shelter being pushed away from the family, or I mean, potentially put down and behavioral issues pop up, whatever. So I think a lot of it is just expectations versus and and really especially like reality versus social media i think in a lot of sense i think that puts a lot of 
unrealistic expectations in people's heads about what their dogs should be. I think that's just training in general. Yeah. <clears throat> like we see that all the time, right? Like I, ta- I actually, I posted that thing on Instagram today and kind of dug into it a little bit is I see often um, the realities versus social media and people are like constantly getting frustrated because they're like, well, the trainer that I follow is they're in their house with their dogs and they only train their dogs in their house and they're giving advice on like, and it's fine and it's great and it's probably helpful to some people. But the people that are like, when I went outside, it didn't work. And I'm like, well, they're two different things. Those aren't real. And that's why sometimes the training advice isn't applicable or your methodology, your methodology isn't applicable the way that your training isn't applicable to like a clinical environment or a studio versus reality. And that, that's also a whole other conversation. But I just think like I've been seeing that recently where people, you know, because the algorithm always will pop up dog stuff. And I try to post and ghost. I know you like that post and ghost. I do like post and ghost. But that's what I try to do is I just post on and ghost because I just don't have time to do all that bullshit. But I see that a lot, though, is people will be like, this is the way to train dogs. And then I'm looking at this picture of this one individual that's been training their specific dog that they've had since a puppy in their house with nothing else going on. Look, this is all you have to do. And it's not even, it's not wrong, right, or indifferent. It's just not going to be applicable to most people's realities of, well, somebody just adopted a dog and they live in New York City and the dog already came with issues. So what you're training for and what this dog and this owner needs are two separate things. And I think that that's like where a lot of the conflict in the dog training world comes is people take that as an ego stab of like, what are you saying? I'm wrong. No, I'm just saying that your way of training your dog successfully in that environment is not going to be applicable to this dog. And some people have a hard time being like, oh yeah, no, you're right. Because the way that I train is a little bit different. But I think there's an ego thing there where people are just like, they can't accept that. Like the tra- a lot of the training I do is not going to be applicable for most people because the content that I put out are dogs with problems, you know? So it's just it's just this whole thing of social media in general. But that's probably a whole conversation we can spend hours on. So well, I, think, I think that's the thing too is like your, your standards don't have to be exactly what other people's standards are. I mean, whether it's your personal dog or your, your, per, your client's dogs or whatever it is, it's like – I think one of the, and this is more for like trainers that listen to this is like one of the hardest things for me to get by when I started private training and and did took on, started taking on clients and stuff was like, I can't set standards for my clients. I can tell them what standards might be realistic or what expectations or what standards I would have for the dog. Yeah. My standards aren't going to be their standards and I can't push that onto them. So I think that's part of it too, is like everyone is going to have different standards, which I think especially a lot of trainers get into it over that because it's like well, my standards are the right standards. And it's like, well, it's different for everyone. It's very much opinionated. I mean, there are certain things that I think a lot of trainers would agree should be certain standards for certain dogs. But I think a lot of it is also that, uh, no, my standards are right. Your standards are right, whatever it is. So I think that's a big thing too. Yeah, and I had a conversation today with one of my clients where the dog jumped up. And he's like, oh, this is bad. I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed. I'm like, I could care less what your dog does. Mm-hmm. So that's what I tell clients. I don't care. Yeah, like if you yep. if you don't care if your dog jumps, I don't care if your dog jumps. Yeah, it's that's... like I don't like my dog's jumping, but if you want to let him jump, go for it. I always that... see like a smile on clients' faces in private sessions, especially like the first session when I'm just like, "Hey, here's how to teach this thing." Like, um, you know, if it's going well, here's how to advance it slightly. If it's re- if it's not going well, here's how to regress it. You know, so like, you know, so that like, oh, I saw this and it worked here and here at the facility is like. Tom was saying like a very like stare, like a, it's a clinical, like more, yeah. you know, it's a, it's low distraction for a reason, um, especially in like our first private sessions. So, you know, here's how to advance it. If it's going well, here's how to regress it, you know, between our sessions and like, well, what about this? I'm like, you know, I, I'm also telling like the, the last, like, well, what about this? Like, I listen, I'm not spending the next 16, 15, 14, 13, 17 years with this dog. This is your dog. You can either, you know, hold it to the standards but you can, you can, you pick your own ceiling. I'm not yeah. setting that ceiling for you. You choose that ceiling and I can help you get to that ceiling. But that's, that, that's up to you. Yeah. It's that lifestyle. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. And I think that that's like, I think that that's a cool thing that we've created here in general is we're very respectful of one another's styles and opinions. And I just think in general, like we do good at leading with whatever works for that individual. We're not like, like Kyle was saying, there are definitely some things that if they're dangerous, like, oh, you're no, when you call your dog and they don't come back, like, that's not going to yeah. happen. Like, things like that. But 
getting on the couch, sleeping in bed, jumping on you. And I was just, he was surprised when I said that. I was like, I don't, because I think there's this like thing that if you hire a dog trainer, your dog has to be like a robot and perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm just helping you out with the things that you're struggling with. You can do anything you want that makes you and your dog happy outside of this. And I do not care. So if your dog jumps and that makes you happy, that's not going to affect me. Although don't complain to me Yep. if your dog is jumping on other people Mm because those are two separate things. I think a conversation I almost always have with clients is uh, you guys are paying us and me to tell you what to do to better you and your dog's life and the behavior issues you're having. I am not going to be there when you go home to enforce them. Right. So, like, if you enforce them, great, you should, but don't come back telling me you're having the same issues, like your dog jumping and your dog's not on a leash every time someone comes over, or whatever it is, because we've gone through this stuff. So, like, I think a big part of it is it's like your dog doesn't have to be perfect, uh, because perfect is, I mean, obviously, that's it's subjective, I think, a lot of the times to what mm-hmm. people want, but it's just a lot of it comes down to, I think, people, people not realizing that a lot of this stuff, unless it's dangerous, um, your dog's resource guarding the couch. They, they shouldn't be allowed on the couch. Like mm-hmm. it's pretty, yeah. pretty big one, but it's like if your dog's jumping and it's not jumping up and biting people or you have an 80 year old grandmother that's, they're going to knock over or whatever. It's like, if you, if you don't care, I'm not going to be coming to your house and your dog's going to be jumping on me. So I really don't care. Yeah. And I think too, um, and I think Katrina can speak to this too. You can have two dogs in the same household that you hold to two very mm-hmm. different standards. Kokomo? Are you are we mentioning Kokomo? We're talking about Darby. Kokomo and Murphy oh. and Darby and Owen. Darby. Kokomo yeah. lives yeah. a very structured yes. routine in, in my household because she came to me with resource guarding and I knew the behavioral issues I was getting into. I was doing a child abuse prevention job and I knew the dog. I knew her from a very young age. Um, I saw her n- developing these behavioral problems and I had no like nothing, no control over that. Right. It wasn't my dog at the time. Um, so, yeah, when she was a member of my household, that dog has lots of rules in the house. Mm-hmm. Murphy, a saint, yes. a literal saint, can do no wrong. Great personality, can do whatever he wants. I don't care if Co jumps on my bed. I don't care if Co jumps on the couch. Like that's not, um, so yeah. So she, she is definitely held to a higher standard, meaning if she is in my kitchen, she has one spot that she's allowed to be in my kitchen. She's on her place in the kitchen because she has resource guarding with food. Um, she will also resource guard space. Uh, so like, you know, narrow hallways. She's not allowed to just linger. She's not allowed to just lay in the hallway. Oh, she's hot. She's laying on the tile. I don't care. She's not, a, she can lay anywhere else, anywhere else. So yeah, definitely like two different dogs or two dogs in the same household. And they've been cohabitating for seven years now. So this has just been the way of the world. Um, you know, Murphy can basically do whatever he wants. He's 14. He's retired. He can, he can <laughs> I don't care. Um, Owen's retired at seven. Yeah. <laughs> Owen's just a, a baby Murphy, but yeah, yes. yeah. Two, two dogs in the same household held to very different standards. Um, Co is created when I am not home and uh, she's created, you know, anytime that she is unsupervised. Um, Murphy, I don't care if he's free range in the house. And I think that's something too would, when I, you know, Private clients are like, well, do I have to create my dog for it? I don't care. Again, this isn't my, you're, this is not my dog. What do you want this dog to look like? I highly recommend crate training and confinement training if your dog ever has to stay overnight at the vet. If you ever want to board your dog, if you want your dog maybe to go to a board and train facility, it is really helpful if your dog is confinement mm-hmm. trained in some way, shape, or form. But in the house, Murphy just does what he wants. Like, I mean, yeah. he doesn't do anything that's uh, nuisance behavior. So, yeah, but Co has a lot of rules and she yeah. needs, and she needs them and Back to like the mental stimulation, when Co stays home for a few days, uh, you know, if like Heather's homesick and Co stays home, Heather will be like, she needs to go to work. She needs to use her brain because she's being pushy. She knows in the in the kitchen, she will not go to her place right away, type thing, and she knows pretty well at this point in her, our our lives together to go to her place in the kitchen. So, like that mental stimulation is what keeps my house keeps me. It prevents me from having incidents, punctures, fights, scar- like you know, scruffles, um, in my house, but yeah, they are held to very, very, very different standards. And if, if I did not put those standards in place, Co would most likely not be able to be a member of my household. Mm -hmm. And she was scheduled for behavioral euthanasia before I negotiated with the Humane Society to get her off that list. So when I say that she wouldn't be a member of my household, like she would be put down and not by my own liking, but just because she, if I didn't have those rules in place, she would, have punctured she would have had the opportunity to puncture my other dog and I would have had no other choice because in New York State 
that's how the law works. It's not even up to me. It's not something I would be willing to do with her. I would, that's why I have those rules in place, but that's a little more extreme. Like you're, your dogs held to different standards are simply because Darby's kind of a One cracked is a out kid and a Owen is also a saint. <laughs> yes. Owen is a saint and Darby is a nut job. Yeah. Well. But different, different, way different like rule, like reasons why there are such rules in the house. Like Darby's not an aggressive dog no. by any means. He doesn't resource not a mean guard. Bone. Not a mean bone in his body. Just a dog with so much energy that he needs it to be channeled <laughs> yeah. in you know specific yeah. ways. Yep. Like Greta's doing good over there. Greta's, Greta's, Greta's taking a snooze. She's big chilling. All right, I think we'll wrap it up there. All right, dog. Thanks for listening and watching. Bye, guys. Bye.